These are yours. Emails. Everybody sends them um, as a, a WordPress site that you'll almost certainly be sending some kind of emails. But the problem is that a lot of people don't know how to do them properly, and it can be... Oh my. <gasps> we have broken another one. We were joking about this earlier, and I just couldn't believe it had happened. I'll just continue doing it like this, it's fine. Um, yeah, so um, people don't know how to kind of do them properly. Um, and I wanted to talk about it. Um, you know, if you're a WordPress agency, perhaps you might want to help someone get started. It's a way of earning a little bit of extra revenue and helping people um, to get started and understand where they're going with email marketing. Or as a small business, you can take tips away from this as well. So. It's, it's to help everyone. The problem is that people say, we should send emails. And I'll say, great, why? Because people start with this sort of scattergun approach. They'll be wanting to do, you know, if they're a new website, they'll be wanting to do social media, and they want to do emails, and they try and do it all at once. And they'll do it all badly, because they'll start off with the best of intentions, but, you know, they'll eventually kind of lose the will to do it, and then they'll just almost, you know, in some cases, stop doing it altogether. So I've developed a three-point plan to help people strategize um, and plan their email marketing so that they can do it successfully. The first stage is to really do your research and information gathering. And it's worth spending a lot of time doing this um, because it's the sort of ground on which you'll... <laughs> Thank you. Oh. There is my dog scampi, by the way. <laughs> um, so doing the research and information gathering is worth spending some time on. Some things that you need to consider. Who is the person that's going to be sending these emails? And how much do they know about email marketing? What is their skill level? Because if you, you're expecting them to be able to code HTML emails, but they just don't know how to run a website or do any of that kind of stuff, then they're going to get stuck and they're going to lose, like, not want to do it anymore. Then, um, this is a, a bit of a side note to um, doing emails, um, but if you run on a shared server, um, all of your WordPress emails might um, suffer deliverability issues if you're sending them directly from the site. And you might need to consider using a sending service like Mailgun or SendGrid or Elastic Email or another similar service. Um, so that's something to bear in mind if you're on a shared server. There's also the um, standard WordPress emails which are sent. Some of those you can customize a little bit, you can get a bit hacky with them, and, um, but you can also replace them. Um, I'm going to be talking about this in a bit because there's the standard Jetpack um, emails that are sent for blog post notifications, but you might wish to send them from um, another email service provider instead. Then you might want to look for um, a source of people to send to. And a good place to start is any registered users on the site. That's a good grounding for your email list, because they'll have um, shown interest in your site at some point. And then there's also the content on your site. You need to have a look at what, what you're doing on there. So are you sharing pictures? Are you sharing blog posts? Do you run a WooCommerce site that you're selling products on? 
All of those could be a good source of content for your newsletters. So you need to decide what you think is important and what is worth sharing. The next stage is to do a little bit of research. Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Apologies. The next stage is to um, do, do the research aspect. And I like to go away and sign up to a lot of newsletters and get some ideas about the designs and the types of content that they're sharing. And this means that you will be able to perhaps take some ideas away from them, but also um, kind of look at the designs and the layout, the pictures, and see if there's something that you could be using, and perhaps something that they're not doing that you feel that you could be doing better. Then we move on to step two, which is to develop the strategy. And one of the key things about an email strategy is to set some goals. Now, those goals could be anything. It might be that you want to grow your list, and you might say, well, by next year, I want to grow my list by 2,000, 3,000 people. Or it might be that I want to get more people reading my content, so I'm going to send out newsletters about my blog post content. But having some goals in mind and then really thinking about what you're sharing and what you're going to be sending and even how often you're going to be sending will help you to focus on those goals. Here's an example of the um, standard Jetpack email. Now, I'm going to be honest, I don't think these are particularly pretty. <laughs> um, sorry, Jetpack people. But, um, but these are, you know, for a, a, a person who doesn't have any understanding about email marketing, this could be enough. And it allows people to be able to send out content. And, and this email is done automatically. There's no, um, in, no need to intervene in the whole process. It, it just works. And that's great for some users. This is an example from my own blog, and I actually use RSS to email via MailChimp, which just plugs into my WordPress feed. And with a little bit of um, customization and a bit of thought about the design, I'm able to completely customize the look and feel um, and make it nicer for the end recipient. I like the way that I've used, you know, like the buttons, and I've really made um, images part of the whole email. And it just, I've, as an email marketer, I mean, it's obviously what, what I do, so I wanted to make it look nice. For um, the strategy, you also, as I mentioned earlier, people kind of start off doing it, and they have all the best will in the world to do emails all the time. But without preparing a plan for your content, you kind of end up not, not being able to think about what you're going to write next. You might be sat in front of the computer saying, oh, I don't know what I'm going to send today, and feeling an obligation to send because you haven't sent an email for a while. So having a calendar and thinking about planning around certain holidays or times when you, perhaps if you ran a plugin when you're going to do a release. Those things are really important to keep emailing regularly. My ideal way of doing it is to plan emails for, say, three months, up to three months in advance with some fixed content. But then after that, you might have sort of some vague ideas about what you're going to do. But not necessarily having it fixed in. And then perhaps if something comes along and you um, need to change out the content, you can just keep some of the other content for later and you can plan in for another time. And then you don't have to kind of sit there, like I said, staring at the computer. The problem, um, a lot of 
problems with people creating emails that, as I said, people don't know what to say. I would say that you shouldn't always be promoting yourself. I mean, yeah, it's great. You obviously, you know, want to perhaps sell a product or um, that kind of thing, but it's good to share other people's content as well, and it keeps people interested in what you're saying. You should also be reactive, so perhaps if something's happened that's related to your industry, you can really um, like ride on the wave of that by... Um, <clears throat> sorry, I need some water. You can really ride on the, on the wave of that by... Um, using the news or, or um, other stories to um, keep, keep people interested, and especially if you mention it in the subject line as well, that's really useful. You should also keep something unique for your newsletters. Now, when I worked at MailPoet, I used to um, send out blog posts in our newsletters, but I didn't feel that that was enough. I felt that we should be offering more, because we had a very loyal, um, blog post reading um, group, but they, so if, if we're sending them the newsletters, they're probably not going to be as engaged because they've already, we've already shared those blog posts on Facebook or on Twitter or somewhere else where they've, they've already consumed it. So keeping something unique and having like a tip or um, another news article that hasn't been shared anyone else will ensure that you'll have an active and engaged subscriber group. You should also be relevant. And when I mean be relevant, I mean thinking about your subscriber group as a whole and understanding what type of people they are. So if you have um, a, a very technical group of subscribers, then it's probably best to send them more technical content. But if you send technical content to non-technical users, then they might switch off and therefore become disengaged with your content. The third step is to design and grow. And I like the KISS method of keep it simple, stupid. Having a, a newsletter with many bits of content often means that you're sharing content needlessly. And sometimes it's better to break those pieces of content up into maybe a couple of newsletters. Why? Well, people actually, as they go down the newsletter, will be less interested in the content further down. So I like to keep newsletters to maybe three or four different messages. And um, if you do have more than that, then you're going to sp split it down into maybe a few more newsletters. Because people read in an F shape, I'm sure you know, on the web, and it's the same for email as well. Your content at the top will be most important and more likely to be read, and the content lower down will be less likely to be read. So keep those key messages at the top. And people also you know, become more and more uh, skim readers as time goes on. So it's good to keep the content split up and that's by using images, headings, and using things like italicizing or making bold um, words in your content to really draw people in and to give them an idea of the content without them having to read the entire article. You should also provide a call to action. And the call to action would be a button, preferably. You can also include text links, but the call to action um, is really important because if you don't get clicks in your newsletters, then how do you know whether people are enjoying the content? An open rate doesn't mean um, that people have enjoyed the newsletter because you don't know how long people have been reading it for. But if you use a click, it means that people were going to be interested in your content. Once you've sent a newsletter out, it's a good idea to um, review and, re and look at the reporting. This is um, an example from my email blog and um, a newsletter that I sent out a few months ago. 
Now, on this heat map, you can see, I hope you can see at the back, but it says 20% at the top. That's, uh, that's 20% of people who read this email clicked on, on that link at the top. And then you can see a massive 80% of people used the call to action at the bottom um, to click through and read my post. You should also note that the um, picture is also a link, but nobody clicked on that. And this kind of really proves that having a call to action is important and that um, taking time to review and see what kind of um, things people are clicking on and where people are clicking is a really useful idea for reviewing and showing you which content people were interested in. It's all very well looking you know, at a, a list of links and seeing what people clicked on, but I really feel like a, a heat map is the most useful way of reviewing your content. Now, you, OK, so you said, I'm going to send a newsletter out. That's fine. But how can we grow our list? And there's a number of ways. Obviously, you will want to perhaps put some sign-up forms on your website. You might want to put them in the sidebar as a widget. Some other good places are to put them below the blog post, just before the comments, and perhaps in the header, depending on whether you have a search thing there. You don't want to distract people from it. And I'm also going to go against what a lot of email marketers say, because I've discovered that a lot of my friends don't like it. but. I really recommend having pop-up forms on your website. And the reason for this is that um, I find that people do engage with them a lot more. Now, they have got a bit of a bad rap, I will be honest. They, um, they, the, the problem is that many people use them badly, and they'll pop up on the site as soon as you've had, uh, like as soon as you've got onto it, so people are put off by them. But if you do them properly and you do them correctly, then they can, they can be very successful. And the way that you would do this is to ensure that they pop up after a certain amount of time, or that you might want to use exit intent to, um, to have them pop up then. But I, I really like pop-up forms as a way of recruiting. And also, um, my recommended plugins for this uh, well, I use Pop-Up Ally. It has a, I've bought the premium one, and I find it very powerful, if a little tricky to set up. Um, but there's also things like Optin Monster and a few others that um, uh, all do the same job and uh, can be very successful. And when you, when you perhaps buy these plugins, you will find that you will get a lot of tips from them about how to successfully use them. Another tip would be, if you're, if you're intending to use plugin, um, a pop-up plugin, is to consider having different types um, on different pages, depending on where people are um, visiting or browsing your site. And you can target the pop-up um, messaging towards where people are looking. A few little tips for you, um, some definite do's. When signing up, consider offering a free gift. Now, that could be an ebook, or you, if you're running a WooCommerce site, that could be a, um, like a discount. Those types of things would really help to encourage people to sign up and, and give them a reason for um, giving over their email address. Because you know people just kind of think that they'll give it, and then you're just going to spam them forever more. So be a nice person and, and give them something in return for handing over their email address. The second thing would be um, sending a, a welcome email out. It might be just one, or you might do a series. A series um, can be useful because it will create a relationship with your subscriber. In fact, um, your subscribers are most engaged in the first 60 days of you of them having subscribed. So it's really good to build a positive relationship with them then. Perhaps you might want to introduce your company and tell them what you're about. Then you can, you know, if you didn't want to give a free gift straight away, you could in consider incentivizing at the end of it. And thirdly, 
once you've got those people on there, you do need to do some housekeeping occasionally. Why? Well, your deliverability can actually be affected by subscribers who are not engaged. So by that, I mean people who are not opening your emails, not the people who are unsubscribed, but the people who just receive the emails and never, ever read them. Because, for example, if you've got a load of people on Gmail who are um, not opening your emails, you could actually end up going into the junk mail for other Gmail subscribers. So you need to keep engagement up, and engagement is opening and clicking, and even replying to your emails. So make sure that you don't use a no-reply email address when you send emails out. Finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about reporting and what it means. Um, as I showed you the click overlay map earlier, but it's also useful to take a look at some of the other information. The first 24 hours are usually the most important in any email newsletter send. Um, as you can see, the, as soon as I sent the newsletter out, um, there was immediate engagement there, and it tails off a lot towards the end. There's also some other information you should know, and that's about um, unique opens and unique clicks. Um, unique opens are ones where a person, it, it's related to the subscriber, so it means how many subscribers have opened this email. But a unique, um, a to the total opens would be where someone has opened it maybe five times, so that would be counted as five, and a unique open would be counted as one. And it's the same for clicks as well. And it's a good idea to get yourself familiarized with what all these numbers mean, so that you can um, see perhaps whether you need to change your schedule or whether you um, might want to consider sending more emails or less emails, and keeping an eye on your opens and clicks as you as time goes on and your email list grows. That's about it from me. Um, I'm BexKR on Twitter. Um, sometimes you can find me lurking around the um, WordPress plugin suggestions group on Facebook too, so I might see you there. Thank you very much.